gives me absolute great pleasure to introduce everyone today to uh, my fantastic colleague Ken Clare who is going to uh, introduce our second uh, or, or rather give our, our second seminar in this series um, looking at PPIE and development of our Obesity Voices Hub. So um, I will hand over to you and look forward to receiving questions. I think um, we've got questions available via uh, or you can insert your questions via Slido um, or you can just pop them straight into the chat in the end at the end and we've got um, several um, or a good chunk of time at the end to to undertake some of those questions so I shall pass you over to Ken so Ken over to you thanks Louisa and uh, that's a really nice introduction and build up I hope you live up to that now I think I'm going to do better now I've found the mute button um and thanks for asking me to do this talk and i think it's a sign of how important ppie is held in the institute that i'm the second talk um i've just put up my affiliations and obviously i'm part of the institute i'm also director of support services for obesity uk and i know there's some colleagues from there on the call today I'm also proud to be the chair of the European Coalition for People Living with Obesity and it's lovely to see people from all over Europe on the call as well. And I'm also a proud trustee of the Association for the Study of Obesity. I just wanted to declare some interest that I have some membership of two patient advisory boards, one with Novo Nordisk and one with Boeringer Ingelheim. I've also been paid in the last 12 months for a presentation by Novo Nordisk and for delivering a lecture by Apollo and the surgery. I want to start right at the beginning and a bit of a story because I don't really do data. So if you come expecting a lot of data, I think you might be a bit disappointed. No graphs, no charts, uh, pictures, stories. This is me and my cousin and we lived in what was called the tenement in Liverpool. Um, and I'm the chap with the hat on um, and I finished my biscuits and I was just diving over to get me cousins. Um, in those days, it was early 60s Britain, having a what was called a bonny baby and bonny I think translates quite well as heavy or well built, it was the sign of every mother's pride that your baby was well fed. But it, there was another sort of story going on in the background there that weight was important to everyone. And particularly in, in Britain in the 60s, women were trying to get into a shape that perhaps they weren't meant to be. But uh, there was a lot of pressure from the fashion industry, from the diet industry to be focused constantly on weight. And my mum, my mother, was um, she was five foot tall and her weight uh, went up from eight to 22 stone. And that's everything in between. And that blue machine, they were outside every sort of chemist shop or pharmacy. And people used to jump on those machines, put in a silver coin and you get a number. And I can remember every Friday, whatever the dial read, determined how my mother felt for the rest of the week. And it was often not happiness. And food was a sort of battleground at our house. And, but it was also a way of expressing affection. And I think she struggled, my mum, all through her life. I went to school and I was reflecting this morning. I was the second heaviest child in when I was aged 11 in, in our year of 92 boys. And I know this because we did a physics experiment where they lined us up in a row and they weighed us and then they put us. And it was humiliating. And it was something that lived. The ten of us who were the heaviest never got over that. It wasn't a health screening program. This was just an experiment and it was horrible. I had two left feet. I couldn't do any sport. Nobody wanted me on their team. And so my problems got worse. I left home as soon as I could and became a nurse. And that's the class that I trained with as a nurse. Very proud of my career. Um, I was never sure why I went into it. And somebody suggested that the reason a lot of people become nurses is so they can give advice, not take it. And I think that was kind of the case for me too. Living with obesity affected every member of my family when I was obese. Uh, that is my mum at the bottom with her dog. 
my daughter on the left, and I never felt I had the energy or the ability to take part in games with her. And that's my grandmother. Uh, and around those times, uh, probably still the same, some older people are perhaps less than supportive of some things and they haven't got a filter on. She used to come out with terrible things to me. Um, I think there was love in the family, but there was a lot of confusion about weight. I was a yo-yo dieter, a bit like my mum. I could go up and go down. This is on our wedding day. Um, I'm laughing because it's 35 years ago on Sunday. Uh, it's our coral wedding anniversary on Sunday. I only know that because I looked it up on the internet. Um, so 35 years, and I did lose weight in the year before, but I'll put it all back on and some more in the following year. I tried everything, very low calorie diets. They're not as sophisticated or as tasty or as nutritionally balanced as they are now. There's some horrible powders and shakes oh, and bars. And I went to Slimming World and Weight Watchers where I was always the only man. And a lot of chaps I speak to tell me that too. They're, they're very much designed or were designed in them days around women. I went to surgical providers. I explored a couple of options. There wasn't anything relevant in the UK at the time. I found out about bariatric surgery by watching a program on Discovery Channel, uh, which, and I went to the doctors the following week and said, I want a gastric band. There was a lot of illicit uh, slash illegal weight loss medication around at the time based around amphetamines. Some of that's still around, but it's a, le a lot less common than it was. I took two drugs which were later removed from the market, and I also took a drug called Orlistat, Xenical. And in those days, we didn't know. This is, you've got to remember, this is 22 years ago. We didn't know that we needed to give people counselling when they took those drugs. So approaching my 40th birthday, I realised that I needed to do something. Um, I, you know, When you're 21, reaching 40 seems like a long way off. When you're 38, it gets a bit more frightening. And that was really what focused it for me. And I was fortunate that a, a colleague, a lady who I managed, said to me, um, one of the guys I know is setting up a weight management clinic, which was a very odd thing in the year 2000. His name was John Wilden uh, in Liverpool. And I went along there. It, was called, it wasn't called a tier three clinic then, but that's what it's become. It's a multidisciplinary team. I was properly measured and weighed. I was treated with respect. The thing that really struck me when I walked in was that they had furniture that I could fit in. They had scales that I could sit on and not be embarrassed. Uh, the capacity of the tape measures, just little things like that, the blood pressure cuff, stuff now we're beginning to take for granted, but way back then was amazing. So there's the drugs that I had. One caused depression, the other caused high blood pressure. And I was taken off both of them. I had some psychological support, mostly given by people who weren't psychologists. The first CBT I had was from someone who was a dietitian, and she was fantastic. And she made a real difference to my life. And never once did we ever talk about food. We talked about attitudes and emotions. I also went to a physiotherapy group, which was award winning at the time. This was a, uh, it was like circuit training, I guess, uh, for people living with obesity. And that carried on. And the, the lady who started that at Aintree really broke new ground. So this is a picture of me. Um, for those of you who don't work in stones, at uh, 216 kilograms, uh, about 450, 440 pounds. The badge is a blue badge, which meant I could only walk 10 metres. And the picture there is the day after I had bariatric surgery. And I didn't know what it was. I had no idea. I was completely on my own. I was desperate, but I, I'd have done anything. And that guy in the white T-shirt with 224 on is the surgeon who performed my operation. Um, and my wife in the middle and the guy on the other end was my personal trainer. 
and we felt it would be a good sort of awareness raising thing to get a team together and that was running a 5k race uh, about eight months after I had my surgery so from 10 meters to 5k was a big improvement for me I realized back then the power of the press and Louisa and I always joke she says I've got the perfect face for the radio um, <laughs> And neither was a great fond of the camera, but it, sometimes it helps. I found a friend who was in the uh, the press, uh, and she followed my case. The headlines were cringeworthy, the amazing, amazing shrinking man, but it did get people on board. And for someone who doesn't like the camera, I've managed to find pictures, five pictures where I've been involved in things as far away as the docks down in Liverpool, the Northwest News, Prague, and also I think that's Times Square where we were making a film. I wanted to give some background to me for this because I don't think you can talk about the lived experience voice without listening to the voice and that's, but my voice is only one voice and nobody else is quite like me. There's a lot of identification and people with similar backgrounds, but there's a lot of difference. And we're really excited today to announce that we've started to think about how we might bring that voice to life for presentations like this. We've got two people, but two is 100% more than we had last week. And that's how these things start and little changes. But I know how difficult it is to stand up and be counted, especially when you're living uh, in a situation where you're not happy with the way you feel about yourself or your body. It's a lot easier to get people after bariatric surgery because we've made big changes. But what we want to do is bring everyone's voice. I also want to explain the variety of things. So I live with a problem called bipolar. Uh, people talk about stigma in uh, weight. But people talk about stigma in mental health. And I live with both. And bipolar is, there's more incidence of it in people living with obesity. But for me, I just manage it like a chronic condition, like I manage my obesity. Unfortunately, four of the drugs I take from the selection you see up there cause weight gain. Another condition that I, I, I was unfortunate to live with was a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And I had an aneurysm, like a little bubble in one of the blood vessels in my brain that popped in 2005. I can still remember when it happened, uh, at the actual event. And I was fortunate to be treated very quickly and very safely by a, a, a very interesting technique where they pass a catheter up your leg and into your brain. Um, and I came out of that very well. But another problem that we didn't know then, but we know a lot about now, is that people with, who have a gastric bypass can often have a, a changed response to alcohol. And I'd always been a habitual heavy drinker. And my, the way I metabolised alcohol, but also my behaviours, the way I changed how to soothe my soul, it changed when I had bariatric surgery. And as you can see, I began to develop an alcohol problem. I sought help for that and I was blessed to find it. And I've been a long time away from a drink one day at a time. One of the things for me that's really important is about the people. And some of the people are on the call, uh, some of the people there's thousands, and I wish I could mention them all, but I'd be here all day. But some of these people have been very instrumental in my life. They've put me in places, they've supported me when I'm down, they've carried me, and we're still there now. So you see people from the European Coalition, from Obesity UK, from the Global Obesity Patients Alliance, and you see the anaesthetist who put me to sleep, and more interestingly, woke me up afterwards. He's a lovely man, and it's a pleasure to see him every time I meet him. So the UK, I think we're blessed with a range of organisations. We've got Obesity UK. We've also got Obesity Empowerment Network and all about obesity. And they're all great organisations with a niche in what they do. We've got the European Coalition for People Living with Obesity, which I've mentioned. Just across the board, we've got the Irish Coalition and there's members on the call today. And hopefully we'll be seeing some of them in Dublin in May. We've got the British Obesity Society. And we've got the fantastic Obesity Action Coalition in the States and they're 
online convention is this weekend. Uh, so if you get a chance, it's called Your Weight Matters. Please go and you'll, there's a lot that's so relevant. Concentrate on what you can identify with, not what's different. We've also got some fantastic professional organisations, ASO at the ASO, the surgeons, the GPs, British Dietetic Association and the psychologists working in weight management. And I'm sure we've a thousand and one others that are missed, but they're the sort of groups that have come together. So now I'm going to play a video. Obesity is a highly complex disease driven by many varying factors. Therefore, providing effective solutions and support for people living with obesity requires the skills and expertise from many disciplines and sectors. The Obesity Institute brings together these different multidisciplinary skills, drawing on the academic and professional expertise from across Leeds Beckett University and also our wider academic, policy and practice partners to address these modern challenges of obesity. The Institute has one clear vision to improve the lives of people living with or at risk of obesity. All our work is underpinned by our public and patient involvement and engagement hub. This hub will ensure we have a person-centred approach to our work so we can listen to the voices and see the impact of real lived experiences in collaboration across diverse communities. The Obesity Institute will continually evolve creating accessible and inclusive programmes of work in areas such as prevention, system science, health inequalities and treatment. The Institute will have three key areas of innovative activity – research, education and training, and knowledge exchange. Our core values are showing care, compassion, collaboration, effectiveness, equality and inclusion in everything we do. We want our work to be useful to both the wider public and the individual people that we serve, and to develop a new generation of compassionate, person-centred professionals. To find out more about the Obesity Institute and how it is changing the conversation and landscape around obesity, visit leedsbeckett.ac.uk forward slash obesity institute or follow us on our social media channels. So, I really like those videos and it gives you a time just to take a breath and you can watch them again, they're on our website. I often get asked, in fact, we were in a meeting last night and someone said, what does PPIE stand for? And it was a bit of a discussion. I talk about five or six goals before people got it right. I feel I'm sort of disadvantaged by having the longest job title in the department. It's also been confused by uh, patient, uh, by personal independence payment, personal protective equipment. Some people don't like the word patient because not all of us are patients. Who's the public? Some people like citizens. One of the things I think is really important is not to get too wound up in all that discussion and to try and get to what it really means underneath. Done badly, I think a lot of people can easily tell you the bad things to do. Um, I came from a background where PPIE was the same 10 people or a subset of that. I think that's really bad for everyone, because if you keep asking the same people the same questions, you'll always get the same answers. And I think that was one of the driving forces between the scale that we wanted. It can be tokenistic, and I've been sat in a room with a, a gang of psychiatrists doing a great multi, what was it, multi-centre randomised control trial. And they put me there because they needed someone to get the grant. And they never asked me a question again. And then I just stopped going. It can be about box ticking. We believe that people should be paid and there's agreed rates and we'll talk about them. But more importantly for a lot of people is just recognition. Just being, so, you know, that you're part of it. And I know when we have PPIE members within the Institute, they are recognised and valued. Poor communication. Sometimes people don't get told about meetings. Everybody gets told at the start of, me of projects, but towards the end, people's uh, impetus and enthusiasm drops off. Intimidating values, and I put this picture up because this is the Liverpool Medical Institute, uh, and I sometimes go along there and do talks. And these guys are people who uh, you know, were great medical Victorian uh, pioneers, isn't half intimidating when you sit in the room with them looking down at you 
because I've got a thing called imposter syndrome. I feel I'm in the wrong room. I actually feel like I'm in the wrong room now. And I should be in the back watching everyone else or sitting at the back like I was in school, not listening. And that imposter syndrome can be really difficult to shift. I was involved, my first real good involvement was a thing called the Paris Project. And I want to mention Jenny James. Uh, she was a physiotherapist doing a PhD uh, fellowship uh, in IHR. And she recruited a small group of people. She looked after us. She was looking at exercise and activity after bariatric surgery. She had two children during the course of this project. She never cut us loose. She kept us involved. She used to come along to community meetings. We met in fire stations. We met in libraries. And she encouraged us to get involved with broader groups of people living with obesity. And she's still in touch. And that is fantastic. And then somebody somewhere in, uh, introduced me to Louisa. And I think I remember when it was. And the great thing was this project that came to be called Remission. I soon realised that academics all want a great title for the project. That's a big part of the thing, which I never really understood at first. But I was involved before it actually started. And then we got a thing called an RDS bid, which was a small grant, and it helped us to put together a great PPIE group. We're diverse, we're broad. Um, a couple of the members are on the call now, so I better watch what I'm saying. But I'm honoured to work with them. And they've been used at all levels in the project. There's no role distinction. There's no bosses. There's no sort of, you're the PPI, you do this. They've been doing things at all levels within the group. We have regular meetings. Though I hope that the uh, reimbursement goes through quickly. I know it does because I check it. We've had a publication. Uh, just as a team. But the great thing is we're the great team, but we're part of a bigger team that really value us. And we're led by uh, Louisa. So the mission within the Institute is about people at risk of obesity to develop innovative person-centered advances. But that vision, and it was said in the animation, to improve the lives of people living with or at risk of obesity. And it I can hold on to that and I can grab for that and I understand it. The current response and action to obesity is not working. It's time for a new approach. The Obesity Institute is working together with people living with obesity to change the way we talk and think about obesity. We need to stamp out the stigma weight bias and blame that is too often experienced and provide people living with obesity the care and support they need. To achieve this, all the work we do at the Obesity Institute is person-centred with compassion and inclusivity at our core. It is critical to understand that obesity is a chronic, complex disease driven by many factors such as our genes, how our bodies and brains work, and the environments we live, work, and grow up in. Obesity support is required across the life course, and it is an individual and personal choice to decide when, where, and whether weight is discussed. The Obesity Institute is addressing the modern challenges of obesity, working together with a range of different organizations and people to develop tailored approaches that promote long-term health and well-being. We want everyone living with obesity to feel empowered and receive the information, treatment and support they need. To find out more about the Obesity Institute and Obesity Voices, visit leedsbeckett.ac.uk forward slash Obesity Institute or follow us on our social media channels. So we've talked about some of our the, the three themes, systems approach. And when that's explained to people living with obesity, it becomes so understandable. And we got, keep going back to the foresight diagram from 2007, but people really, it just takes us away from the straightforward narrative. And I think that's really important. Tackling disparities and just huge inequalities around obesity. And we see that so much. But we've so much to do around weight management and well-being. 
And I think that we understand that it might just be beyond going beyond numbers as well and to other ways of measuring things. Knowledge exchange and education and training. And at the moment, I'm involved in all of these things that are going on within the Institute, and it's been an eye opener for me. It really has. And we're at the centre. Um, and we hope we're going to start recruiting some more. The hub I'm going to talk about in a minute, but we are going to be recruiting more to the people to the hub and developing people's roles and opportunities. It's great to see uh, an image from the media bank, which people are to know, and the voice of lived experience. Without listening to our voice, we've got nothing. It's a sterile environment that you're working in. So Louise and I, very early on in our partnership, and it's not just our partnership, there are many others, but we wanted to do something that was led by the voice of lived experience. And I think we didn't know what that was going to be like. And then a, a call, which I think is when people like the NHR, NIHR say there is some money for this type of thing. A call came out and it seemed to suit us because it was a partnership between a voluntary or charity organisation and an academic body and other partners. And we applied for it and we wanted to look at something that was different and innovative to groups of people that we don't normally meet the needs of very well. And we chose South Asian women and members of the LGBTQ plus community who identifies lesbian or non-binary. And we were awarded the grant. And that has been a fantastic uh, achievement, I think, for everyone. We've got a lot of people involved as co-applicants on the grant from those communities. We're going to have community champions. Uh, things are just starting to take off. The work is underway. And for World Obesity Day, we were fortunate to be uh, granted a, a grant from ECPO to produce a podcast uh, to to look at this project um, and it was Louisa, Hannah, Halima, Jimmy and myself and that's available on that link there or the QR code. As I said before this session will be available recorded so you can download it as well. So PPI is in everything we do about care, compassion, collaboration, equality and inclusion and we're, we've still got a long way to go around people first language. I don't think, you know, people have got to learn and then people have got to change and adapt. I, I think that I was very competitive when I first started. Somebody said they first met me 18 years ago and they felt that in those in those times I was brutally honest, he said, about the way I was. Um, I think I'm just honest now. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, partnership is, is key but we don't let people get away with using the wrong language. In terms of uh, our values, you know, these are the NIHR involved framework and we're key, to, we strong believers in that about respect, support, transparency, responsiveness, fairness of opportunity and accountability. And we believe that people who are in PPI should be paid at the going rate for the skills and the work that they bring to the table. Too many times I sat in a room thinking I'm the only person in this room who isn't being even acknowledged. But that is changing. And before we let people go into the uh, obesity voices for an opportunity, we make sure that they understand what that means as researchers. I focused a lot on people because the people are what makes this all great. And our steering committee, we've got, well, myself, <laughs> I'm the chair, but I'm supported in ways she'd never believe by Saida Bashir and Sunit Morley, who are the uh, principal and institute coordinator. And they make everything happen for me and just for, across our group. But we've got a fantastic, a committee where seven people uh, are living with or identify as having obesity. So we've got Susie from ECPO, we've got a group from the LBU, we're blessed to have two councillors, Hannah Bithell and Abby Marshall-Katung from uh, Leeds, 
We've got Bev from Obesity UK, Maggie from OEN. We've got uh, three PPI reps, I call them without portfolio. So they don't identify with any particular organisation, but we're proud to have them there and people from Euro as well. And that committee really do make us able to take forward the work we do. So Obesity Voices Hub, it, we had a lot of talk about what it might look like. And it was started off as a bit of a, we end up with this matching agency where people would come along with an opportunity. We'd have people who were living with or affected by obesity and we tried to match them up. And I, I think we've kind of got there. We've now got 260 people. We've got, um, if we, have, we have partnership arrangements. We have an induction pack for members. Uh, we've got, uh, if you want to register yourself, if you're living with or affected by obesity, you can register on that URL or use that QR code. So 260 people. We are going to develop and mentor the actual people living with who are hub members. We're going to collect and share good PPIE practice. Um, we're going to provide a, a advice and guidance and quite often myself or Louisa or another person can be called in to say what's next. And we've done that with quite a range of people. Uh, I think we're going to need some more training opportunities for researchers. We're going to work on the develop PPIE community. I think it's important to say we don't want to do it all. Uh, there are some excellent pockets and we want to work with those groups. And we want to signpost to existing resources. So I've developed, I've divided the two sets of skills that we uh, offer from on the left hand side, as I look at traditional working on committees, evidence and numbers, how to, this is for hub members, how to tell your story and with meaning and to make it powerful and how to reach least heard communities. And then we've got this newer group of social media, different types of media like comics and films, photo voice, and being able to produce content. But we don't know what training we're going to do until we ask the old members. And I think too long in my life, I've been told what I'm going to do. You know, curriculum have been set before anyone asked me. So we're about co-creation. So it would be wrong to create something without asking people first. And I think that's the same slide as before, isn't it? As doubled up. I'm sorry about that. That's my fault completely. Just to show. So over this coming year, you can see us or me at Bart and other people will be at ECO. A lot of uh, the Leeds Becker team will be there and the Obesity UK and the ICPO team at the European Congress on Obesity in Dublin. Some of us will be at the uh, Bariatric Surgical uh, services conference in Birmingham. Uh, I've been asked to speak about PPI at uh, Naples in the World Surgery Conference and several of us will be in uh, Belfast at UKCO in September. So I'm not going to play that video now, you'll be glad to know, but it's an excellent video commissioned by the Royal College of Physicians uh, Rachel Batten did a fantastic job of bringing that together and got some really good speakers, really good facts. If you get a chance, go and watch it. Watch it. Um, a big shout out, uh, something which everyone here is really excited about, is about the new Master of Science degree in obesity. Um, and I think this is going to be a real game changer for me about the way things are going forward. I'm super excited because they, uh, they've asked us uh, as people living with obesity right from the start, not just me, but also members of the uh, Obesity Voices Steering Committee. Uh, and I can see Claire's on the call today, but if you want to find out more, there'll be lots coming in the news about that. Another shout out for the uh, Obesity and Disordered Eating Coalition. And this is really important because I think that this is something nobody really asked us about before. But when we started to dig a little, the number of people, I include, include me, who live with disordered and emotional eating and obesity is 
way goes way deeper than anyone thought and is is worthy of a lot more work. So if you want to join up, um, we haven't got any money as yet, but we are going to be going for it. There's a QR code, and there is going to be a, a disorder or emotional eating symposium in a Dublin in May. I'm looking forward to that. But I think one of the things I keep going back to this thing, you know, but if you've got the right people, if you get a great group of people, I mean, you just got to have a good time. And it, things may not be any easier, but they're going to seem a lot easier when you're with people and you're laughing and you're smiling. And I think that really captured us, uh, I think, at UKCO. And it's only part of the team here at um, Leeds Beckett in the Obesity Institute. But I'm proud to be a member of them. And um, we should put a caption contest in for next time. I'm nearly done with the advertisements. Uh, one more, and that's the next seminar, which I'm really looking forward to about systems approaches. And I know there's a lot of interest from the lived experience voice in this. So that's on the 31st of May. Uh, it's my colleague, James Nobles, and I'm really looking forward to that. You can register there. And now the bit I'm not looking forward to, I'll pass you back to Louisa. I don't know where to stop sharing or what. Somebody will tell me, I'm sure. Thanks, Louisa. Oh, Ken, thank you so much. That was a fantastic overview. Um, just so insightful and so inspiring. Um, and I can see we've got some uh, really interesting questions that have come up already. Uh, I think um, Sunit has put the link to Slido. So please do feel free to pop any questions in Slido, pop them in the chat or um, you know, by all means, pop your hand up um, and, and ask them directly. Um, so if I may, um, I wonder if I could start the questions um, with the first one that's on my list here. So somebody has asked, um, which communities do you feel are least heard in terms of PPIE input? I'm taking a strong, sharp intake of breath because I think it's something we've talked about. Um, and which will be very difficult, which five will be very difficult, but I think there are groups of people. Um, and I'm, you know, the difficulty when you list them is that people interpret that as an order of ranking. But, um, you know, for me, people with learning difficulties, um, people with severe and enduring mental health problems, I think that um, people from all sorts of uh, ethnic backgrounds that um, and that can be at so many levels and at such a local level that for instance in Liverpool I think there are 32 groups that you can look at. Um, men some people talk about but again I understand that um, but they are underrepresented. People somewhere on the neurodiversity spectrum I think that that is a, is a worry for me. Uh, people uh, who are housebound, um, and you know, there's some excellent work um, come out of a woman in, in Glasgow, Kath, Kath Williamson, and I think that's a group of people we've really got to look at in some way. That's great, thanks, Ken. And I know we had many a discussion when we were developing the NIHR grant as to, you know, we want to develop support groups that are tailored to everybody that currently isn't heard. And it was kind of hard to pick um, two to start off with. But hopefully if we can start to develop a bit of a blueprint and a framework for how we take forward those groups, that information will help the development of many more groups that will hopefully support everybody and every community that, that is in need. So, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's really, really helpful. Um, I've got a second question on here, if I may. Um, what advice would you give to anyone thinking about undertaking PPIE for the first time? I think it's ask. <laughs> um, you know, and we'll always, so long as, you know, we'll, I'm more than happy to give a short period of time just to push, point people in the right direction. Uh, there are some excellent resources. Um, 
as I'm always, I was always amazed with how small a chunk of money can make a big difference. And there are small pots of money available. Um, we are trying, I know ASO are, are very good at helping people to access chunks of money like that. We are trying to work with the bariatric surgeons as well. Um, but I think really, if you come a lot, more than happy to give informal advice. That's great. Thanks, Ken. And I think sometimes having that peer support and actually just being able to talk to somebody else that's done it, I, th I think is really helpful. And I guess it's also, to uh, you speak to some people and some people have very fixed ideas about what a PPIE role is. And I guess it's also to say it's a really diverse role. So we have PPIE members in a whole range of different activity and it can be from a, a kind of 15 minute phone call to being involved as a co-applicant and uh, a, a, an integral part of a big um, project like the remission study. Um, so yeah, no, that, that that's great. Okay, um, I've got another question here, if I may. So um, if the research community, community could change one thing to improve PPIE, what do you think that would be? What's a shout out for any academics on this call? I think consistency and recognition. Um, and I, I think I once drew a curve, that I think, uh, be as enthusiastic at the start of the project as you are at the end. Um, you know, it's not too, too often I get approached right at the last minute for people who want to put a bid in. So, and, you know, I think one of the things, and, you asked me to get involved before there was even something to get involved in. So it's being prepared. Great, thanks, Ken. And I must say, my my big, big bugbear as an academic is, I know as a research community, one of the things I think we are very bad at is, and, and I think you said that Jenny was so good at and gave such a good example, and that is keeping in touch and, you know, you know, feeding back at the end of the project and, and actually keeping that co-production, that co-creation, that communication alive for the longer term. Um, and I, I think that's something we can we can definitely um, improve, improve on. Um, I've got another question here. Um, if I wanted PPI involvement in a project, how would I get in touch with Obesity Voices Hub? Well, um, you can... I should know the email off the top of my head. I've just said about three times, but I'm sure if we can. If you email me at k.clare at leedsbeckett.ac.uk, and I'll put you, I'll help you, and then put you in the right direction. Brilliant. Thanks, Ken. Um, and I can see we've also had, and this might actually be a question for Claire rather than um, you, Ken, if Claire is on the call and can come in. So somebody has asked, is the um, MSC all in person or is it virtual? Now, if I'm correct, Claire, please shout if I'm um, not. Uh, the answer is to start with, it will be an in-person MSc, um, but as the programme develops, I think we've got aspirations for it to become um, virtual as it develops. But I think to start with, it will just be in-person. But Claire, please shout. Yep, I'm getting a thumbs up for Claire, so uh, I'm all right. So great. So hopefully that's helpful. And if you want any information about the MSc, and there'll also be um, sort of smaller um, professional development um, qualifications if you haven't got the time to dedicate to an MSc but are interested in some of the modules. So if you're interested in 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 either the CPD element or the MSc, please do get in touch. Um, I can see we've got a, another question. Um, so what would you recommend doing? Oh, sorry, just had. To my computer's popped up, if um, PPIE members suggest things you don't agree with, um, such as a person living with obesity saying they don't like person first language. Oh, that's a tricky one. Mm. Well, I think one of the advantages of recruiting through the hub, through Obesity Voices, is that you can always come back to us and we can broker some kind of meeting. Um, you know, 
People, it is a broad chest, but there are fairly some things that are fairly non-negotiable. I think, um, but you know, I see that more as a a case for education. And if we can't agree, then we maybe have to come to a, a, a way around. Yeah, and I think having that the infrastructure of the hub, and we've got a very strong governance that underpins it and codes of conduct. I think that will all help you know support that kind of transparent um, and supportive process where we are very keen to um listen to listen to everyone but we do have a very sort of um strong code of conduct and, and something like um person first language would be a kind of a, a part of signing up to the to the hub and undertaking work with us is that agreement and commitment to use non stigmatizing and person first communication. Um, I've just seen another question that's popped up. What support do you think bariatric surgery patients need? So many stories of people regaining weight. That's a really good question. It is. Um... And as someone who's lived with regain and loss and regain and regain again, I don't think there is one clear answer because if there was, we'd be doing it. Um, I think that we are approaching a time when we're, gonna, we're starting to look at things differently, aren't we? And that when I had my bariatric surgery, it was an operation and fixed you for life. Um, that was the, inter the understanding. I think that, you know, we're seeing now, um, I think we've seen, you know, tier three weight management is going to get better. That I've seen the development of bariatric physicians. I think that's really important. I think a real, and I've said game changer once already for me, is going to be more psychological support. I think that if you consistently ask people who are struggling, what this, you know, what they think was happening, help them. It, it would be psychological support, um, but I think it's about a tailored approach to, you know. When I first came around, I think we thought we could group everyone in one big thing, and it's actually getting far more complex. I mean, the other thing that I missed out a group when we were before is I'm twenty years further down the life course than I was when I had bariatric surgery. And I think that has an impact on people's lives. Um, and I think that's something we've got to look at. Um, and of course, you know, there are new medications that are going to be available over the next, well, some we know about, some may be happening soon, and some we haven't even heard of yet, somewhere down the line. Yeah, I think that's that's really important. And I know so certainly from an institute perspective, we are very focused on person centred care. And I think you're absolutely right, Ken, in terms of acknowledging the complexity of obesity and the need to tailor support to the individual and to acknowledge that different people will need different tools, different support, and that support may indeed change across the life course as well. So I think that that's really important. Well, I can, I'm looking at Slido and the chat and I'm not seeing any more questions coming through and I'm conscious that we are drawing to the close of this session anyway. So I'd just like to say a huge thank you once again, um, Ken, that's been a really, really interesting session. Um, we've got a couple more minutes if anyone has any um, last outstanding sort of burning questions if not um as ken said myself the uh, obesity um, institute team and and ken are, are always available um, um via email if you'd like to get in contact with us to hear more about any of the work we're doing or any of the work around obesity voices so i'd just like to say a huge huge thank you and uh and i shall let everyone go and get a cup of coffee <laughs>